Good morning and welcome to our service at Cold Harbor Evangelical Free Church on YouTube. Great to have you with us. Let me just uh, welcome you on behalf of the church. The church is a small one in the southeast of London and uh, this week is actually one of our missions weeks and that means that uh, what we have is opportunities to focus on some of the missions organisations that we support and some of the people who work for those organisations but also you'll have the opportunity for church members to give to uh, the missions organisations in particular two that we support uh, which are Christian Prison Resources and uh, also the Barnabas Fund. So if you want to do that then um, you will be able to do so either by contacting the treasurer, uh, Jeff, or uh, you will have had an email from Phil and uh, the details of how you can give are on that. So please do consider that, um, but uh, great to be able to be together. Well, I want to also invite you to, um, for those who are able to, to come and join us for our communion service. This evening we've got um, a short time of uh, catching up with the missionaries that we support and we're going to then pray for them and uh, also meet around the Lord's table uh, to remember him in the way that he has uh, commanded us to do. So be good to have you with us, that's at 6.30 and there'll be an invite, a Zoom invite later on. So let me start by just reminding you of some great words of the psalmist. We were looking at this uh, for those of us in our midweek groups this week from Psalm 13, those last couple of verses. This is what it says. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Well, let's do that as we start and sing together God's praise. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Let's pray. 
Eternal God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the one who loved us, who saw us in our time of need, and who indeed uh, saved us by making it possible for that sin uh, infection, that virus of sin that affected all of our lives and all our thinking, all our speaking, all our actions, but you sent the Lord Jesus to be that one who would cure us, heal us, who would restore us into that right relationship that we could become your children and that we could be forgiven for those things that we have done deliberately wrong and those things, Lord, that we don't even realise that we have done wrong. And so, Father, we thank you that you recognised us in our frailty, that you uh, recognised that we needed help. And we thank you that you have brought us to be your children. And we ask that this day we would be indeed be able to praise you, that we would lift you up on our praises, not just as we sing together, but as we remember who you are, as we recognise what you have done for us and as we look and seek after you and so father we pray that you would direct our thinking and make us those who would love you more and we pray this in and through the name of our rescuer and saviour jesus amen psalm 99 and verse 2 says great is the lord in zion he is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Let's sing together. Restore, O Lord, the honour of your name. of sovereign power come shake the earth again that all may see and come with reverent fear to the living God whose kingdom shall outlast thee restore And in our time, revive the church that bears your name. of sovereign power come shake the earth again that all may see and come with reverent fear to the living God whose kingdom shall outlast the year Oh
So I've got three pictures that I want to show you and I want to see if you know what they are and what you use them for. So let's try and see if we can do this. So the first one, here it comes. So what are these called and what do we use them for? That's right, they're binoculars. So binoculars can be used to see things that are in the distance. So you might be wanting to look at, well, I've got a son who looks at aeroplanes. And so he might use a pair like this to look at aeroplanes. But you might look at birds, you might look at uh, something that's on the horizon you can't see very much, it's far, far away and you want to see it better. So that's the first one. What about this? Do you know what this is called? That's right, it's a telescope. And this is a very special kind of telescope. It helps us to see the stars. Uh, and so and we were thinking last week when David was telling us about the sun and the stars, that the stars are so far away that we need something like this to help us see them because we can't see them apart from a tiny prick of light in the darkness sometimes. So this helps us to see the stars clearer. What about this? Do you know what this is called? My third picture. It's a microscope. And what does a microscope do? Well, it helps you to see things that are very, very small and makes them clear. So you might see the tiny bits of cells, whether that's an, a plant cell that makes up a whole leaf, or it could be something from a, uh, a drop of your blood, or all sorts of things you can see in a microscope. So what do these three things all do? Well, they all help us to look at something or see it better. Now, we've got something that does that as well. Here it is. It's, can you see it there? It is God's Word, the Bible. So the Bible helps us to see God, and as we look at that, we can find out what he's like and get to know him better. And so that's what it means to seek, look at, look for God. Now I've got a memory verse that I want to teach you about looking for or seeking God. It's a very well-known one, and to help you learn it and remember it, we're going to use some hand signs. We sometimes do this in our kids' club um, when we've not been all locked down. And so I'm going to show you this verse and we'll read it together and then what we're going to do is we're going to put some signs to it. So here's the verse. It's from Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 and it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Let me read that once more. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Well, what does it mean? So Matthew's written it down for us, and it's talking about when Jesus was teaching people. And he said that we are to seek God's kingdom and the things that uh, please him, that are right in God's eyes, that's what righteousness means, and then all the other things that we've been looking for or trying to get hold of, they will be given to us as well, because actually we're putting God first. So that's what it's about. Now, let's put it together. So here is a B in sign language, like this, B. Okay, so that's going to be our B for but, but, and then we're going to do this for seek. Okay, we're going to do a pair of binoculars. But seek first his, talking about God, and then we're going to put a crown on kingdom, and his righteousness. Yeah, it was right in God's eyes. And all these things will be 
given to you as this is a W. Well, okay. So, but we didn't tell you where it was from. So a M in sign language is three fingers of your right hand in the palm of your left hand, like this. M, yeah? M for Matthew. So Matthew, and we're going to do chapter six, a thumb and five fingers, Matthew chapter six, and verse three tens and three ones, 33. Okay. So Matthew chapter six and verse 33. You got it? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Let's try it once more. Are you ready? Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Thank you for listening. Gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, and freedom, my steadfast love.
The psalmist says in Psalm 33 verse 4, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Let's sing together, From the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun, I will stand on every promise of your word. As you are aware it's missions week and Ken has asked me to lead in prayer. Now during the coronavirus pandemic missions organisations are facing particular problems um, not least in raising the finances that they need to continue. So please commit yourself to pray regularly for at least some of those workers that we support. This evening we'll be hearing from Alastair and Helen, Josh and Danny, 
and Timothy Lawrence, and we'll be praying for them. And during the week, we'll be praying for David Fortune and CPR and for Barnabas Fund. So this morning, I'd like us to pray particularly for Caleb, for Mission Care, and for Tim Osgood. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for those who serve in the UK and elsewhere to take the good news of Jesus to those you are calling. Thank you that when we pray, we are partners with them in building your kingdom. Encourage us to remember them frequently in our prayers. We pray for Caleb as he and Ambassadors Football in America face long-term restrictions due to the pandemic. This is severely limiting their opportunities to share the gospel and having a significant effect on their financial income. Please give Caleb and the whole organisation such wisdom so that they can remain truly effective ambassadors of the great gospel of Jesus. We lift Tim Osgood to you. Please continue to help him as he ensures that finances get to the workers in and around Afghanistan. Give opportunities to further the gospel to those on the ground, despite the limitations imposed by the pandemic. And we lift mission care to you. We pray that the staff will not become fatigued after so many weeks of having no visitors or outside agencies to assist. And those outside agencies and visitors are so vital to the well-being of the residents. Give wisdom to the home managers as they seek to allow relatives to visit, usually using the gardens. May everyone act with appropriate care to protect the residents and relatives alike. Help the pastoral team to make wise use of the opportunities they have, even though their movement from home to home is still very restricted. May those residents who know you be encouraged and strengthened by your presence with them in these lonely days, and open hearts and minds in residents and staff who don't know you to hear you speaking to them. And we ask these prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. I've asked Agnes if she would come and do the reading for us. It's from Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And let's hear God speak through this passage before Phil comes to preach on it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. 
Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servants away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not hand me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Well, good morning. Over the last few weeks, we've all become familiar, haven't we, with long distance conversations. Uh, talking loudly over the garden wall with someone standing inside their front door is fairly typical. Or calling up to someone standing on the balcony of their flats. So here's a question for you. Do you practice social distancing when you pray? I'm not talking about you and your prayer partner praying over the phone or over FaceTime or Zoom or whatever, but not social distancing between people praying, but us being socially distant from God. I don't think standing two metres apart is quite the right picture. Perhaps a, a better picture is standing just outside the palace fence and calling out so that God can hear you in his throne room through an open window. And because we're all good evangelicals and we know our Bible, we know that God has heard us. And we finish our prayers content that we have prayed, as we should, and that our prayers have been heard. So I have a second question for you. Are you happy with that? <clears throat> Are you happy to have come to the palace of the king and stood at the fence calling out to the God who hears? Think about the times when you pray, either alone or with another person or praying at a prayer meeting. How often do those times feel like you are standing at a respectful distance and calling out to God? I'm going to be honest with you now. That is my experience fairly often. I'm not saying that my prayers haven't been earnest and meaningful. I'm not saying that my prayer is a waste of time. Far from it. My concern is that too often I am content with that. I'm content to call out to God from a distance. Content to know that God has heard me. It's not really been a face-to-face -face meeting. But then I hadn't been expecting a face-to-face -face meeting with God. So my time of prayer has lived up to my expectations. And I go away content. The great King David was also familiar with such times of prayer. But he wasn't content with them. Right in the middle of the psalm that Agnes read to us, we have these words, seek my face or seek his face, to which David responds, your face, Lord, I will seek. Let's pray that God will teach us what it means to seek his face. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we call you Father, but for some of us we are too often content to speak to you as a distant king. You call us friends, but we are too easily satisfied 
uh, to glimpse you from a distance. Teach us what it means to seek your face, to use the privilege that has been bought for us at the cost of your son's life, to speak to you as a child speaks to a loving father, to know you, to know your heart, and to rest content in your will. Teach us to pray like this, O Lord. Amen. So this is my title, Your Face, Lord, I Will Seek. This is literally the centre of Psalm 27, and it's helpful for us to know that this is a psalm of David. Now, this psalm, this poem, this prayer, has a very clear structure. There's a sort of mirrored symmetry in it, and it will help us understand David's heart if we understand the structure he crafted so carefully. Have a look at this. Now, please don't try and read the words off the screen. I'll display the words for you to read later on. This is just to show you how David's poetry works. The psalm starts and ends with, the statement, with statements of confidence in God. That's the bits in red. The second bit and the second to last bit, those bits shown in blue, they're about coming close to God and being accepted by him with willing obedience and joyful worship. The green bits are David humbly pleading with God, recognising his neediness and weakness before a holy God, which quite clearly makes verse 8 the focal point of the psalm. This is the verse where David says, Your face, Lord, I will seek. This is the very heart of the psalm, and it's the very heart of David's desire, as we will see. Seeking God and seeing him face to face is David's priority for his own life. And when he hands the kingdom on to his son, it is David's priority for the nation. And we'll look at that briefly too. That leaves us, of course, with the last verse, which we will come to at the end, where it belongs. And that structure, we'll have a, a closer look at that in our midweek groups this week. So this psalm, or this prayer of David, starts with incredible, real confidence. In fact, David's confidence is so great that if you take verses 2 and 3 on their own, they sound like appalling conceit. Just listen to them. Forget what comes before and after for the time being, but listen to this. When evil men advance against me to de devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. You see, on its own, it's, it's pure pride and bravado. It's, it's a megalomaniac just waiting to be toppled off his throne. But of course, verse 1 and the following verses make all the difference. If you need an example of the importance of the context of a passage, this is a really good one. So let's look at verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David starts his prayer with solid reasoning. Reasoning based on God's character and God's purpose. God's character is powerful and faithful. He is the origin of life or the light of life and a stronghold. And God's purpose is to preserve and save his people, his chosen ones. But David is also speaking from his experience. 
He knows God's character and purposes because David has already seen what God has done. And isn't the logic compelling? If God is powerful and faithful, and if God's purpose is to save his people, and if that has been my experience up until now, and the experience of saints over the ages, well, whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Yes, the logic is compelling. Now, having attended many prayer meetings at Cold Harbour over the last few years, I think we are quite good at using compelling reasoning in our prayers. Anchoring our prayers in the character of God and praying in line with his promises. We generally do that in our prayer meetings, as some of you will know. But when it comes, but what comes next in David's prayer sounds like a different voice in David's head. I mean, can this be the same bold, confident, triumphant man speaking? Listen to verse 4. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, or this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. The great warrior Shouting down the most aggressive enemy, confident in the face of all-out war, has one request of God. Not victory, not success, not the acceptance of his people, but one thing above everything else. To enter the intimate presence of God and to gaze on the beauty of his face. There's a lot of prayer going on at Cold Harbour week by week. We don't have a prayer meeting at the moment because we have up to 16 prayer meetings. And we'll be continuing prayer partners for a while. So let me know if you want to join our group of prayer warriors. But whether you are about to pray in a prayer partnership or about to pray on your own or going to a prayer meeting, which will take place eventually at some point in the future. What is your desire for that time of prayer? What is the one thing you desire above every other request? Let me just remind you of what David's desire is. One thing I ask of the Lord. This is what I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. The secret of David's successes is not great military tactics. It isn't a committed army. It's not cleverly worded speeches. David had all those things, but they were not the heart of his successes. No, the secret of David's success is to dwell in the house of the Lord and see the beauty of his face. What is it that you pray for your church here at Cold Harbour? What are the concerns that you have at this time? What is it that would make all the difference to the effectiveness of the church in caring for our members and in reaching out to the people around us? Maybe your great desire is for better worship. Perhaps your overriding concern is having the right pastor in place. Maybe your worry is not having the right approach or approaches to evangelism. Or are you concerned that people are not sharing their lives together as they should? Some may feel that we are being held back because one group or another is being marginalised in the church. 
If you have any of these concerns, then can I tell you, I'm really grateful that you care enough to be concerned. And all of those things need to be prayed about. But none of them, none of those things should be your greatest concern for yourself or for the church. You see, David could have focused on all manner of important things. The unity of the nation, the future king, the immediate battles to be fought and won. <laughs> Maybe that his own conduct should remain pure. And all of these are important. And they all feature in David's prayers, as they should. But David knows that if his priority is right, then all these things will be taken care of. And he states this at the beginning of verse 6, and he reiterates it in verse 12. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. And then he goes on to say, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. Dwelling in the house of God and gazing on his face is the secret of David's success. But to dwell in God's house and gaze on his face doesn't just happen, even though it is a privilege given to us in Jesus. You know, when David prepares God's people for a new era, for the rule of his son Solomon, in a time of peace and for building the temple, what is David's priority for the people? Obey the king? Be good citizens? Give generously of your time and money to the work of God and to building his temple? None of the above. 1 Chronicles 22.19 says this, and this is David's priority for the people. Now set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Set your mind and heart to seek the Lord your God. Seeking God or seeking his face is an active process requiring mind and heart or heart and soul as it appears in other translations. So let's look back at Psalm 27 to see the way David sets his mind and heart on seeking God's face. I'm going to read from halfway through verse 6. At his tabernacle I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. David comes with joyful worship, as directed by God. And in David's mirror of verse 6, he emphasises obedience and willing submission to God's will in verse 11. Paul tells us that we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. This is our obedient and joyful act of worship. It's not that we have lost the righteousness that we have in Christ, but also note this, unrepented sin will always be a barrier in a relationship. Think of this, if I behave wrongly towards Jenny and break the trust of our relationship, I don't stop being her husband. I'm just as married to her as I've ever been. But I can't look her in the face with joy.
at his tabernacle I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. Obedient, joyful worship. Now look at this last bit of verse 6. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Now this is both a response to God's presence and a prelude to David bringing his neediness to God. David comes to prayer with praise. You'll have noticed in the prayer partner outlines that I send round, I always encourage us to start with praise based on truths from the Bible. And that really just reflects our practice for many years in our prayer meetings. You know the song, don't you? I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. Well, the tune may be a bit 1970s, but the words are pure Bible. At his tabernacle I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Obedient, joyful worship in our lives and on our tongues. And in verse 7 we see that David comes in great earnest. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. This is the same great, confident, foe-crushing victor of verses 2 and 3. He knows where he stands before God. He's not too proud to beg and call out for God's mercy. We need humble seriousness in our prayer. You see, when God has revealed his will, then David will declare the purposes of God with great confidence. We have that in verses 1 to 3 and in verse 13 at the end. But on matters where God has yet to speak and act, David doesn't boldly declare what God is going to do in every situation. No, David comes to God humbly, recognising his own neediness and appealing to God's mercy to protect him and give him an answer. And just a couple of verses later, after that heart of the psalm in verse 8, David makes another humble statement of his total dependence on God. But when he makes that plea, he makes it with total confidence in God too. Look at verse 10. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. You see, if you behave really awfully, even your mum and dad might reject you. It happens. But David knows that this will never happen with God. And let's face it, David knew this to be true, even after his adultery and conspiring murder of an innocent man. Oh, when we come to God, let us be constantly aware of our weakness and neediness as we come to seek his face. And now we come to the real heart of this prayer, verse 8. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. And rather annoyingly, the translators have come to different conclusions about who speaks first. Some translators have concluded that the Hebrew text implies that God is speaking. God says, seek my face. And so they add a few words to the text to make this clear. Other translators consider that this is David speaking to himself, which doesn't require the extra words. Either way, the outcome is the same. David declares, your face, Lord, I will seek. As we saw earlier, coming into God's presence and gazing on his face requires an act of mind and heart. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Remember this structure.
David has gone to a lot of effort to emphasise the central point of the psalm. Your face, Lord, I will seek. David's desire, above all other prayers, is to come into the close presence of God and to gaze on the beauty of his face. And the pattern David creates around his central concern reinforces the acts of heart and mind that must accompany David's desire to be close to God. David starts and ends his prayer stating his confidence. Confidence anchored in the character and purposes of God. Confidence reinforced by David's own experience of the working of God. And after that initial statement of confidence, he then states his heart's greatest desire to dwell in God's house, not just visit the palace of the king and view it from the outside, but to come close to God as a child is close to their father, as a man confides with a close friend. And the sense of the intimacy David desires goes even further to gaze at the beauty of God's face. What an extraordinary thing to desire, intimate face to face with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of this universe. And yet, this is our privilege too in Jesus. Because we are in Jesus. In some mind-boggling way, we can share in that perfect unity of the Godhead. To know God. To understand his heart for us and for our church. To know his priorities for us. And to have that willing submission to his will. In the total security of the protection that his presence brings. But although we have this privilege... We will not experience this closeness if we don't set our heart and mind on it, as David so clearly does in this psalm. Is your desire, above all others, to live close to God, so close that you can gaze on the beauty of his face? If that is your desire, is there something blocking out his face from your sight? It's not God's character or his purposes. We must have total confidence in those. Maybe our pride is getting in the way and blinding us. Maybe we are too conceited to come humbly begging God to accept us and our prayers. Like David, we must approach God deeply conscious that we don't deserve his acceptance. Or maybe there's some sin blocking our mind from seeing God. Beg God, like David does, to teach you his ways, his straight paths. And be ready to worship God with your life laid down in sacrifice. But despite the terrible nature of our sin, we don't come into his presence mourning over our sin. We come with joyful praise. Joyful because where sin abounds, God's grace abounds even more. Would your prayer this week be, Lord, your face, Lord, I will seek. And so we come to that final verse. It doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the pattern of the psalm. And of course, That's just the way David intended it. How strange to end this positive and and, um, confident psalm with waiting. Patient endurance is a theme that crops up again and again in the Bible. We have looked at it over the last few weeks in James. Patiently enduring hardship, even suffering the ongoing abusive behaviour of other people towards us. And the experience of so many Old Testament heroes is no different, including the experience of David himself. 
but the waiting David writes about is so different to our normal human experience. This is not waiting and longing for a loved one to return. This is not desperately scouring the horizon for a way out of our problems. David is talking about waiting for God's timing. But while we wait, we are waiting right in the close presence of our loved one, of God himself, gazing on his face while we await his will. Safe in God's house, sheltered by his love, secure in the salvation that has already been accomplished. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Well, we're going to close with prayer. And after we've prayed, we'll end with the same choice as Ken had from last week. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, please don't let us be satisfied with calling out to you from a distance. Show us that to dwell in your house and to gaze on your face must be our priority above every other desire. Oh, Father, to know such closeness to you, to feel the security of your presence and to see your beauty. What could be more important? Make that our desire. And give us that confidence that in Jesus we are accepted and you will not turn us away. Show us how we must change to submit willingly to your will in every avenue of our lives and clear away the pride and sin that obscure our minds from seeing you face to face. Do this so that in whatever circumstances we find ourselves, we can wait patiently for your will to be revealed, secure and joyful in your presence, but patiently waiting for your time. May our times of prayer be times of meeting you face to face, and may that knowledge of you, your intimate presence be our daily experience. We ask this with confidence in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
are forever Lord of the ages God before time We are a vapor You are eternal Love everlasting Reigning on high Redeemer, mighty to save, you are the Lord. 